Welcome everybody to the Pies Committee meeting for October 23rd. I'm Laurie Kinnear, the chair of Pies, and I am unable to see today, thus the dark glasses. So I am going to turn it over to Council Member Stratton to facilitate the meeting. Thank you. Yes, yeah, she wears those glasses and tells you to do something and you can't say no. <laughs> but we will, we will get going. So this is a really jammed agenda. So council president, rather than having to uh, see anything, is gonna be the timer with Jacoby. So we'll stay on track and get through all these items. First up is approval of minutes. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, minutes pass. Going on to discussion items. Outside council contract amendment. So Elizabeth here. And we have that down for five minutes. <laughs> I'm not sure I need five minutes. Um, this is a contract amendment with outside counsel Craig Trueblood, who represents us on our NPDS appeal. Um, we will set for trial in November, and we need to add money to the contract. So we did an executive session last week and talked about the litigation, and this is that contract amendment. Perfect. Any questions? Anybody have questions? Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. All right. Uh, quarterly range change, SBO, quarter three, 2023, David Moss. Oh, Chris Redmond. Yes, thank you, Council. Good afternoon. Before you in your packet, you have the range changes that uh, the HR did a salary review for the last six months of the year. These range changes are done quarterly. This year we've only um, been able to do two salary ranges on the special budget ordinance due to staffing. Could but you we're speak hoping... right into that microphone there? Oh, that, yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Is it gonna, you show her how to lower the. It's low. Oh yeah. Is it's it low? low? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so the, in your packet you, you have the salary ranges. There's 34 positions, um, and it does affect 61 employees this quarter. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Are these in the 2024 budget? Then? They should be because the departments are the ones who uh, requested the salary surveys, or they had civil service do a job description review, and or the um, bargaining unit has asked us as well to do a salary review. Go ahead. So I, th I think these are planned for in the 24 budget, but but the SBO is for 23, right? So we're- Correct. So, <laughs> so the will rest be... of the, yes, the remaining two months, they should be also in the 2023 budget. Oh. Okay. Any other questions? Chris, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Eldon Brown, come on up. We're going to talk about Ordinance C-32457. Good afternoon. We actually vacated this right away of 6th Avenue back in 2000. It was just uh, from Audubon Street west to the railroad right away. And the location of this is, you can kind of see Government Way just off to the west, so it's in the lower southwest part of town. What the applicants are now wanting to do is, this property all went to their property owner on the north side, so he's in here to develop that property. When we actually vacated it back in 2000, we reserved an easement for AT&T at the time, which is Comcast. We've since got a letter from Comcast saying that they no longer need that easement in the right of way, so we're just going to amend the ordinance to actually release that easement, what we're trying to do. So be happy to answer any questions on it. Anybody? That was great. Thanks, Eldon. Okay, Jackie McConnell. Okay. Instead of Director McConnell. Perfect. And we're going to talk about the ammo value blanket. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Nick Briggs uh, for the Police Department. Uh, we are requesting to use our value blanket and a suspension of the rules to get this approved today. Um, Director McConnell is very apologetic due to some internal communication um, mix-ups that this is kind of last minute, but the, the issue that we are forecasting is a if we are unable to 
replace this order by the 30th of 15% or higher increase in the price. So with the value blanket, we are locked in um, to our current purchase price, but we've got about a week to get that in. So if that's, that's where the suspension of the rules request comes in. Comment, go ahead. Question, so I, and I've asked this question before, but I keep coming back to it, and I know you use live ammunition to, uh, for training and so forth. And I'm wondering, is there any improvement in technology to the point where you wouldn't need to use live ammunition, but you would be using virtual training? So that's an excellent uh, question, Council President. The answer is yes and no. Um, the yes part is that one aspect of use of force training and firearms training is the decision making process. And certainly technology has done wonders to help us with that. The virtual machine, our reality based training, um, but that is only one side. The, the fact is that firearms proficiency is a psychomotor skill as we term it. It is a physical skill um, similar to playing a sport and the only thing that replicates that is actually doing it. So while technology has certainly helped in some aspects, um, and, and many could argue equally if not more important in the decision making, and we are constantly innovating and using that technology, there is nothing that replicates the need to be physically proficient with the skill of firearms marksmanship. Thank you. Yeah, I would just add, if anybody um, on this dais hasn't done the Vertra, uh, you know, do do reach out to, the, to PD and set up a time to, to check that out because it's definitely a worthwhile experience and something that you'll get a lot out of, so. Happy to host anybody whenever they're there. Go ahead. Just, a, just questioning, we were just so frustrated this came at such a late in the game uh, request when it knew it was coming. So what was, what was the delay that now we got this urgency, we don't have, a lot of time to really delve and, into it. And uh, Council Member Wilkerson, I would love to have a great answer for you. Um, other than some internal communication breakdowns, I don't have a lot of okay. details. What I can say is talking to Director McConnell, there are already provisions in place to start this process much earlier so that we do not um, cross this path again, that uh, months in advance, uh, she was very apologetic and um, yeah, we don't want to be in this position. We, are, we apologize for that, but we are taking measures to ensure it doesn't happen again. So, um, Council President, or, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead, Ryan. So this ammunition is used um, both for training and also officers, this is Correct, what there is, yeah. yeah. So there's several different types of ammunition, um, training ammunition, and then what we term duty ammunition, so. And this uh, covers all that? Correct. Uh, and we get those from two different suppliers, but the value blanket is for both of those combined. Go ahead. Yeah, my quick question, thank you for all this, is um, what do you do about mitigating or reducing the need for the lead cleanup of the ammunition? Uh, so the lead cleanup, it, it actually, there was some discussion that it, it doesn't occur every year, it doesn't need to occur every year. The lead cleanup cost is actually mitigated by the funds that we generate from outside agencies using our range. So if you look at, and I think this year, I've got the numbers here, is a roughly $65,000, um, and that's steadily increased the amount of money that other agencies are paying us. Um, so that lead cleanup is offset by our outside agencies using our range. Anybody else? Oh, mm -hmm. Councilmember Bingle, I apologize. Did you have a question? Not right now, thank you. Okay. So my only question is then do we, during briefing session, are we gonna make a motion to get this? Okay. All right, so yeah. that's the next step then. Okay. Yeah, and my understanding is I'll be back for 3.30. Yes, perfect. Nick, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Council. Inga Note, we're gonna talk about Inland Empire Way study. Good afternoon, Council. We received a $300,000 grant, <clears throat> excuse me, from the state to do a planning level study and preliminary engineering for Inland Empire Way, and this is the project to connect it through to the Cheney-Spokane interchange as a two-way street. Um, we still may have some members of the development community who may do the one-way northbound connection as a mitigation 
um, but this would be the larger project that would make it a, a two-way street. So it's looking at that and then also looking at what kind of changes might be needed on Inland Empire Way north of that location as you go through the valley and then up onto Sunset and it ties back into second and third. So Inga, how does this fall into the 195 study? Where is it? Is it in the list? It is, yes. Okay. It is in the list, it's on the impact fee list. Yep. My question would be when does it, when are you able to start the study? Mm -hmm. um, as soon as we get the contract signed. Okay. Basically, yeah. So it'll be coming through to council before the end of the year, probably in a week or two. Perfect. Yep. Any other questions? Nope. Inga, thank right. you. Thank you. Appreciate your work. Ryan Shea, we're going to talk about wheelchair 2024. RFP. Thanks. Colin is joining you. And Colin okay. will help me field questions. Okay. Okay, there it is. Okay, good afternoon, council members, council president. My name is Ryan Shea with Planning Services. And for the past year, I've been helping manage the wheelchair program, which is our shared mobility program, which um, is the Lime scooters and bikes. Um, and we're moving into our next phase of wheelchair, which is uh, RFP number two, which is for next year. So just some quick statistics about the wheelchair program. Um, the, we've achieved a million and a half trips over the life of the program, uh, which started in 2019. Uh, we're averaging about 1,300 trips per day. Uh, there's been trips on every single street in the city. Uh, this, and, and on busy weekends, we're hitting over two rides per vehicle, which puts us within top 15 cities worldwide. This metric is particularly important because um, it's one of those metrics that uh, the providers look at as a sign of success. Um, and we did do a community survey in 2020 which showed majority support for the program. A uh, quick timeline, uh, just where we've been, where we want to go. So in 2018, we had the pilot program. Following the pilot program, we selected Lime as the operator for the wheelchair program. Um, and they, they had a full season, first full season in 2019, with the modified season because of the pandemic in 2020, which was the latter half of 2020. And then their um, first, and then full year operations, 21, 22. And then this year being the last year of the contract, uh, specifically the end of next month. And we're hoping to release the RFP mid-December and then have it go through mid-January to late January to give a little bit of buffer for the holidays and then approving the contract in February or March prep for the next season. So for the 2024 RFP, what's new? There's really four kind of primary areas we're trying to focus. Um, number one being sidewalk detection. It's a bit of an emerging technology in the field. Um, formalizing a water retrieval process, uh, placing more emphasis on parking requirements, and uh, continuing from the last RFP to have it open to more than one operator, potentially. So sidewalk restrictions, we have sidewalk restrictions downtown, i.e. you can't ride Lime scooters on the sidewalks. Uh, that uh, we've obviously had, had issues with that. Um, so in order to manage that problem, that's where the sidewalk detection potentially comes into play. Uh, sidewalk detection can tell when a scooter gets onto a sidewalk very quickly. Right now, all we really have is GPS. It's an imprecise technology. Um, so once, once, if we, if we're able to get that technology, we can essentially dictate what happens to the scooter once it gets onto the sidewalk, whether that's slowing it down significantly, stopping it completely, <clears throat> gives us the tools. 
And we could do that in other smaller business districts, couldn't we? Yes. Okay. Uh, one of the other uh, focuses of the RFP, and it's more in the operating requirements, is formalizing a process to retrieve scooters out of the river. Um, we, the old RFP and in the new RFP, the intent is to have the operator responsible for retrieving scooters out of the river, but if, if for some reason they can't or they're taking too long to retrieve them, we have a way to retrieve them and get reimbursed from the provider. Um, and quick note on that, we have secured a small contract with a um, licensed, bonded, insured contractor who was recommended to us from Department of Ecology to help with that. So right now it's a bit of in, it's kind of in the test phase with that, but we do have someone. So parking requirements is another issue um, that we've been experiencing with the program. Uh, here you see kind of the parking requirements in a downtown environment. So essentially they should be parked in the uh, furniture zone close to the street. Uh, we've also had issues with uh, scooters being parked in neighborhood sidewalks, kind of completely blocking the sidewalks. Um, so this is something that we're hoping to handle through the RFP. Uh, basically, you know, tell us about your um, examples of how you've successfully navigated this issue in other cities. Um, we also have mandatory parking zones in the downtown core. Uh, these mandatory parking zones only exist in digital form, so when you're riding the scooter, it'll, it'll show you a map of where they are. So one of these solutions here is um, we, we can mark those areas. There's some low-tech, cheap uh, solutions that other cities have done. City of Seattle, for example, just got some tape and stencils and marked off uh, kind of mandatory parking zones to help uh, keep the scooters. Um, organized and yeah just wondering uh, I've, I've encountered a few times and I, I think Councilmember Bingle had the same situation and Councilmember uh, Bingle has a question too, okay so. just the inability to park at the pavilion and can we fix that because it's pretty frustrating when you ride to the pavilion for an event only to find oh there's nothing you can do but ride back to where you started to park your bike Colin can you is that a no parking zone It's kind of an area of negotiation because the pavilion is is also a hotspot for kind of vandalism using the scooters. So, but I think that's something we can find too to allow parking near the pavilion, yeah. while also keeping them out of the pavilion itself. So, I think that's one area where like sidewalk detection technology yeah. could probably help us out. Yeah, that'd be great. Councilmember Bingo, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thank you. I wanted to ask a little bit more about the sidewalk um, detection technology because. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I did the white cane day, and I was blindfolded walking downtown, um, and uh, it was pretty terrifying at times when you had scooters that were supposed to be on the sidewalks was in past you. And so can you tell me a little bit more about the sidewalk detection technology and how reliable it is and how that's going to help us with you know folks who are uh, blind and hard of hearing? Yeah, council member, that's a good question. I'm no expert on the technology. It's... It's been around for a few years at some companies. Lime has started investing in it, I think, in 2022. Um, from, from my understanding, talking to people in the industry, is it, it can be very reliable. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but it's pretty sophisticated. Um, some of the RFPs from other cities kind of have a uh, phase-in program with sidewalk te technology just to make sure that it's working and and um, just kind of uh, language regarding okay we're going to have these tests with all interested operators to see if the sidewalk technology actually does work so we can kind of fold that stuff into the rfp does that answer your question yeah i i like the would be very reliable. I would love to have some more information on that if, if anybody can provide it. Um, I think that's my biggest concern. I love the Lime scooters. I think they're great for getting around, uh, but there are some real challenges we need to overcome, and I appreciate you guys looking into it. Thank you. 
We have Council Member Orlick and then Wilkerson. I've also appreciated the Lime scooters, but I am worried about are we accurately measuring the cost to the city? Has there been any impact study on just this weekend? I saw just some scraping on curbs because Lime scooters are being treated like skateboards, uh, just the streaks on sidewalks, just expenses of any litigation that's come up. How are we tracking expenses to the city? Yeah, that's a good question and probably something Colin could answer better than me. Um, I, one way we counteract the expenses to the city is we, we charge them fees every year, so an annual fee to, to start operating here and then per vehicle per day. And so we have an account to to address any fees that come to us. So like cleaning up the pavilion, they had to resurface the whole pavilion, um, which is about $15,000 and, and we paid for that. Um, so we're able to account for the fees that we incur that way. Um, but Lime has all the responsibility for the vehicles and the users. So any liability associated with the vehicles and the users, that's all through Lime. Um, and, and so they like a scooter that's damaged, it's, that doesn't come to us. So. We're able to track our expenses pretty clearly through that through that account. Just, thank you. Uh, just a quick question on specifically in front of River Park Square. You know, you don't want the lime scooters on the sidewalks, but there is so much traffic to put people in the streets right there is quite a hazard, yeah. especially for the ones who are at least over age to be able to ride in those lines. I mean, really, people are just parking up and down there, so that's a scary place to be. Uh, on a lime scooter because there's no designated biking yeah it's it's one of the core issues is is just creating safer spots safer spaces to in the street to be able to ride the scooters ride ride your bikes ride any device really um, yeah. yeah i i'm just wondering to, uh, are we negotiating anything in here that will allow us to further hold lime accountable when rules are broken I think it'd be pretty cumbersome for us to go after the users on a per issue basis. But yeah. if when those incidences occur, whether it's blocking a sidewalk, illegally riding on a sidewalk, whatever, um, if we could hold Lime accountable, whether it's a fine or something else, and then they can always go after their users. But I'm just curious, is that a part of the negotiation in this new RFP? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, one more question. Yeah, I was just wondering on, um, Collisions or injuries that have resulted from Lyme scooters or bike pedestrian. If there's a, have we seen a difference between sidewalk collisions versus street collisions for users? Because um, that kind of goes to the point that Council Member Wilkerson was making. One could have more significant injuries too. I don't know if that's been happening or if that's been looked at. Yeah. Most of the data we get is pretty anecdotal about where the crashes are happening just because crash reports don't have a category for the scooters as a vehicle, so they get lumped in with all other collisions. Um, so the best way we can do that is to hire someone to sort through the crash reports, and, and that's a pretty expensive endeavor. So it's, it's all pretty anecdotal, but we did some spot checks on corners downtown, so at like Howard and and Maine, we stood out in the corner at lunch and then in the evening during kind of rush hour periods and kind of tracked. And what we found is that it was about evenly split between scooter users on the sidewalk and in the street and bike users on the sidewalk and in the street. And, and so um, overall, because they're going 15 miles per hour or less, um, most collisions are pretty minor, uh, like you're getting bumped up and scraped. Um, the most catastrophic collisions are when people have been in the street on a busy arterial and they get hit in low sight conditions. And that's when there have been really, you know, serious injuries or fatalities. One more, one more question. Okay, one more question. I'm just, I'm just trying to understand, have we talked to PD about updating that category? Because that seems like a pretty simple solution to being able to track some of these issues. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, it's a statewide form, so it, it would have to happen at the state level. And from my understanding is that it, there's some resistance to it because it does add work for the police department that's already has a lot going on. So I think there's some resistance to adding, making that form more complicated because it does add up, you know, once you start applying it. But I would think that there'd be a way in the police report to even if they just reference Lyme and then when you do a search for Lyme through all their police reports, they could pull the ones that reference it and do a, a reverse analysis that way. Yeah, we'll follow up with the police department. I can't speak on their behalf. Okay. I probably said too much already. So. Okay. 
So one of the other focuses for the RFP is going to be opening it up to multiple operators. The original RFP in 2019 did was open to multiple operators, but we're just continuing that through on, on with this one. Uh, we had a study done prior to the first RFP in 2019 that um, basically informed how we were to administer, how we should administer the program. One of those um, recommendations were to go with one operator just because of our the size of our city. Um, usually uh, the, the kind of threshold for getting into operators is about 500,000, uh, cities of 500,000. So we're, we're expecting to go with one, but um, the, the option to have multiple operators is there. There could be a scenario where it could be very advantageous. So we wanna keep that option open. One, one more quick follow-up on that. Will we, will we get um, notice if there's more than one applicant to the RFP or will that decision to only go with one be made internally by you? Uh, presumably internally or... I would just request that we get full notification if we could. Yeah, that. Um, you know. we're, we're going to request council participation on the review panel for Great. the RFP. So yeah. there was a council president was on the review panel for the original RFP and we'd request something similar Perfect. for this round. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, so that's really all I had. One thing I did want to mention was this went to uh, the Plan Commission Transportation Subcommittee and Bicycle Advisory Board, and their response was uh, they support the program, but they want improvements, and that's really what we're trying to do. So, are there any more questions, any comments? Other questions? I think we're good, thank you. And thank you both for meeting. We had um, a meeting with um, one individual who represented the um, Blind and Handicapped Association, who really had some good suggestions as far as um, making these safer, keeping them off the sidewalks. And thank you for participating in that. It was a long meeting and you took lots of notes, but I appreciate it because I think sometimes we forget that um, there are populations out there that need just a little bit more safety around them when they're downtown. Our pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, sewer rehab program. Nathan and Marsha Davis. And I have this down for 10 minutes. Okay. Hopefully less, yeah. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, here today to talk again about the water and sewer rehabilitation program. <clears throat> so for a little bit of context, um, property owners, <clears throat> excuse me, Property owners are responsible for the maintenance of their water and sewer systems uh, inside the city of Spokane. As you can see from the graphic there on the water side, that's from the water meter to the house. But on the sewer lines, that's uh, from their property to where it connects in the city sewer pipe. <clears throat> These costs can be significant, um, it range in anywhere from $5,000 to more than $35,000. <clears> Despite these significant costs, there's limited financial assistance available. Um, and one of the other thing, one of the other considerations with this is usually uh, property owners find out find out about this in an emergency situation, and not many people have an extra thirty-five thousand dollars to just spend on getting their sewer line repaired. So uh, ICM has had this uh, program kind of in mind for the last few years, and we're trying to bring it forward now. <clears throat> uh, so about the program. We're envisioning a 10-year loan program administered by a qualified third-party administrator. <clears throat> loan repayments will be added to the monthly sewer bills. Uh, why we're doing this is, again, like as I said, little there is limited financial assistance available, but there is legal requirements. Um, so for the sewer line, there's limited financial system financial assistance available, but there's legal requirements such as. Um, if you're within 200 feet of a sewer line, you have to connect to the sewer system. Uh, all of this is to help protect the Spokane River and the aquifer, our important drinking water. This program will be for property owners who are making 80% or less of the area median income <clears throat> and have a water or sewer system that's in need of rehabilitation. They have to reside within the city's water, water or sewer service areas. 
and we are envisioning this as an initial five-year program subject to annual uh, availability of funds and program, program utilization. Uh, currently planning for a $500,000 annual budget for five years. As I said, administered via or by a qualified third party. We're going to select that via RFP <clears throat> and we will evaluate after five years. Uh, part of that evaluation is we're going to try to gather some demographic data at some point in the application process and analyze uh, what communities we're helping with this program. Timeline, I uh, hope to bring this to you all next month for approval. Uh, shortly after that, issue the RFP, contract award and negotiation in December, and hopefully have the program start in February 2024. Are there any questions? Okay, let's do one, two. Can you just uh, clarify what, what types of projects are um, covered under this or would be? Uh, so if you have, <clears throat> if like your sewer line uh, is in need of repair, that'll be covered. If you need to, if you're on a septic system and uh, we're per the SMC, you're supposed to be connected to the city system, it'll help cover that. Um, so, so it's just like a break in an irrigation line that wouldn't be covered or something? No. Okay. So it has to be, is it something then that's under the, the public? infrastructure, so like the sewer under the roadway, is that what the requirement is, that there be some sort of nexus with? Yes. Okay. Hold on, no. we got, yeah. yeah. Next. Okay, go on. So you, <clears throat> excuse me, you said water service area, so that means it's not necessarily inside the city of Spokane, is that correct? Yes, but if they're paying, so, if they're paying city yeah, utility no. rates. But still we're offering grants to people not within the city limits. Well, it's not a grant, it's a loan. It's a loan. So okay. they will be repaying it. Okay. Um, on the utility bill. On the utility bill. Interest free, I'm assuming. Uh, low interest. Okay. I, I just wanna think about that for a minute because I think we should be serving people inside the city limits first before we go outside. Okay, let's do. And I just want clarity on, on what this money could do. So. The sewer line from my house, you know, one of the older homes where they're kind of like the old paper liners. Um, so that goes, I have to totally replace that. That loan could be used for that. Correct. Does it have to be like a total replacement or could I get some sewer company come out and put a liner in it for $2,000? Well, I maintain? think you have to follow whoever they pick with the RFP. So. If you oh. get the money. Okay. If you, okay. I'm sorry. If you use the money. Mm -hmm. We'll have qualifications for the different projects. Um, mm -hmm. That might sound like a good idea, but it may not be sustainable. So we want to have something. If it's you're talking about the Orangeburg, the cardboard mm -hmm. um, slip lining, that may not be the best interest because you can have settlement, and then in the future you can have more problems with it. But you know we would evaluate each one of these. That would be our third, our third party. Um, that would go through and actually evaluate the applications. Um, you know, to help them okay. find a, an answer to this. And, oh, is there another question? Um, and I, I really appreciate this program. I, I think it could provide a lot of value to folks in Spokane, but the 500000 what would that cover? Because folks are already repaying the loans, the third party is getting the interest payments, so what's the 500000 cover? That um, becomes kind of our seed money for a repayment program. So we've identified this amount of money, um, and like, like Nate said, we're gonna evaluate that, how far that goes. Um, costs have gone up quite a bit. Originally, we were looking at $300,000 for this program, but since the infrastructure costs have gone up, um, and we're not sure exactly what level of interest, although um, we have heard that there are quite a few um, in our, um, single family repair program. There are several, we've heard through that that there are some, there's been some um, families that have come in, some property owners that have come in and uh, maybe half a dozen a year. So we're not sure how much, how expensive each one of these are. So we've des designated that much money to see what we can cover. So the plan is after five years, it would become self-funding. But that's why we'll do this evaluation because we're not really sure how far that'll go. I think what he's asking is, we don't do this work, so this would be mm -hmm. third-party people. So then they get paid, and um, we provide a loan to the customer, 
and, the, and so the third party contractor, whoever you hire to do the work, working with this company, the third party evaluator, and somebody will come in and actually do the work. They get paid and then they pay back that loan over time. So it isn't that city staff doesn't do these individual repairs. So this is, so the money is pay up front and then it gets replenished over time as people pay back those loans. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, my, my only ask would be that there be flexibility in, in who you could hire since ultimately the, the homeowner, property owner has to pay this back. They should be able to, to seek out the best deal that they can, so. Yeah, um, talking to people, or talking to SNAP, who does the single family home repair program, they, I think, if they if they applied to the RFP, they had been planned, their, the SRHD has a sewer contractor list, and that's who they would be directed to, and the resident would be able to choose from that list, I believe. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you. Uh, I, I was just wondering what, what interest rate would it be at, the low interest rate? We're currently planning for 3%. 3%. And have there been discussions about um, any grant options for those who are very low income or no discussion around that? We had discussed that. Um, it just became more complicated in this program of, um, you know, from a utility we can't gift mm -hmm. funds. And then it becomes more complicated. How do you determine that, and how do you determine a grant? I think that's something in the future we could, uh, we would be open to maybe consider. Um, we're trying to make it simple when we start, so we can be successful to start, and then see what, how we need to, if there's a need that we need to modify. Did you have anything? No, I'm good. No? All right. Thank you both very, very Thank much. You. Okay, we have the two Kristens. Just one? Okay. We're gonna talk water conservation education. Yeah. Well, just one in person. Kirsten will be joining us uh, over WebEx. Okay. So, wish us luck on this you got this. technological endeavor. <laughs> See if it works. Okay. Nope. I think that was Kirsten. This is Kirsten. Hi, Kirsten, we oh. can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Cool. cool, okay. So, good afternoon. I'm Kristen Zimmer, the uh, Water Conservation Program mm -hmm. Manager for the city. Um, work in the Water Department, and I'm here to uh, give you some updates on the education and outreach uh, that was uh, done for this year, for this growing season, in regards to our drought ordinance, level one. And I know. The big question is, does it work? Is it working? Are we saving water? And I can't give you that answer yet. We are, this is a cultural shift, right? That's gonna take time. And to get reliable data is at least probably 10 years before I can see a trend. So there's at 60, more than 66,000 accounts in our residential customers. Um, that use around 10 billion gallons. So for us to see that the dial move um, and for other cities that have done similar programs, it takes time. So bear with me. I want to know too. I really do. Okay. So we focused on three messages this year. It was watering on an odd even schedule, avoiding the peak heat of the day and the fact that we can help. We have tips and resources for you. So um, just to overlay of our programs we offer, we have our Spokanescape grass replacement program or lawn replacement program. So that's for people that are ready to make that move and change their landscaping, reduce their water, and go for a low maintenance, drought tolerant landscape. We have a water efficiency checkup, which is uh, we, do, we do indoor and outdoor consultations, and that's really for folks that want to improve their efficiency. They might have all grass, or, or it could be a Spokanescape, but we evaluate the irrigation and provide uh, efficiency recommendations. We have rebates for all sorts of water efficient equipment and hardware. We also have some free uh, fixtures and things we hand out. We have a commercial program that assesses indoor um, and large landscape use for the commercial sector. And of course, we have education, uh, in-person, 
what is it, 2020? Uh, yes, it's in person, at libraries or in classrooms or at community events um, and contests. Okay, so we'll start with Spokanescape, our lawn replacement program. We're on our fifth year and it's continuing to grow in popularity and uh, um, participation. So what I like about uh, the program now is we've added a few more things to it. So I'll, we have a DIY video series for people to help go through the process because it is cumbersome if anyone has done it yet. It's a lot of labor. Uh, we have additional rebates you could add to your project. So if you installed a controller at that time, you could get a rebate uh, up to $100. Or if you're converting an old spray system to drip, there's a $200 rebate. So it kind of incentivizes the whole Spokanescape program a bit more. So instead of $500, a residential customer could earn up to $700 in credit on their utility bill. But most exciting program we added in, for 2023 was the designer at your door. And this is for our Spokanescape customers that want to make the shift, they want to move forward, but are not sure how, right? And I know when I did my landscape, I would have loved to have some help from a landscape architect. So we have a part-time landscape architect that um, you can schedule an hour appointment with, and in, within the hour, she can sketch up a plan for you. So it really removes that barrier and helps kind of nudge people forward. Um, and this is an example of one parkway project just this year. So it's a brand new program this year, um, over 60 appointments, and she's still booked like through December. So she's uh, part-time, but um, very, very popular. And out of this program, we had four completed projects to date. And that is a beautiful example of one. Our, we ran a WaterWise Wednesday workshop series from March to the middle of May and had over 500 people attend um, to, in total. And that was all focused on sustainable landscaping, whether it be plants, irrigation, firewise design, um, all in that kind of realm of things. So that was very popular. We'll be running that again for sure in 2024, partnered with the Shada Library for that because it does have a beautiful view, my favorite view. You've been in that room? Mm -hmm. Our good old shade of water tank. It's just perfect. Okay. Uh, again, the um, irrigation consultations or sp sprinkler system checkups is running great. We have uh, 111 done to date and it, is just another oppor great opportunity to meet with customers one-on-one, -on -one, answer questions, help them find more efficient ways to water their lawn. And typically we're seeing, if you could kind of see the bar chart there, people are watering at least three times as much as the plants actually need, right? So if we can even get them to half, that's, that's, that'll make a big, big difference. Um, so this is our second year running those. We'll have numbers when I come back in, the spring, so I can show you the successes, hopefully. Our commercial program, we've added more customers to that. We, Deaconess came on board, as well as the Davenports. We're working directly with the historic Davenport. Uh, it's a very old building. It's got a lot of water-cooled equipment and odds and ends. Um, same with uh, Deaconess, we're evaluating their cooling towers. So any kind of water-cooled equipment inside a large facility, we're helping either sub-metering or uh, recommending efficiencies. Okay, we have our kits available at all times. If you go to waterwisespokane.org, you can click on a link to our free efficiency items and it sends you to a page where it's like almost like you're shopping. Uh, you can get a shower head, an aerator, hose nozzle, whatever you'd like. You could get all of them or just one thing and we'll drop that off. At, a, at the home or, or mail it if we're too busy. Uh, and then again, rebates, we have a serrated drip, rotary nozzles, smart water monitors, that's the thing that attaches to your existing meter so you can get minute reads on, on how you're using water. Uh, low flow toilets, cooling controllers, and smart irrigation controllers. So that's, oh, almost done. 
the uh, and our one of our challenges we run a photo contest for Spokanescape and a Waterwise challenge every year. So this started in 2020. The, we had 60 participants that sign up and their goal is to beat their water use from the year before, just measured in July and August, right? Our peak months, the heaviest time for irrigation. So we had 60 people sign up this year and our, uh, yeah, and rewarded them in almost $5,000 in credits. Okay, any questions for me at this point? Anybody have questions? Keep going. Awesome, okay. Um, I'm gonna hand this over to Kirsten Davis, but I'll be the clicker. Good afternoon, can everybody hear me? We can hear you. Okay, um, sorry I can't be there in person. I am sitting in a uh, beautiful, sunny downtown Palm Springs at the moment. Oh. Um, but I wanted to go over the uh, communication side of things that we did with um, water conservation this year. Um, obviously, you heard some great things from Kristen on the programming side. Um, and so this is what we did on the communication side. So you should, uh, it should be, or Kristen, can you put it on the slide that has the, um, the city, city communications? We see that. Okay. Um, so this is the list of all the tools we have in our, our tool shed. Um, and so we'll kind of go through those one by one. So if you want to um, go to the next slide, Kristen. So through our normal utility communications, um, our utility bill inserts, uh, we had, um, we put in both our water quality report reminding people about um, the every other day watering and the time of day. Um, and also in uh, June of every year, we put in the um, inserts in their notices. Uh, Did we lose her? I think so. Sounds quiet on that end. Are you still there? She's still, the phone is there. Unmuted. Hello. No, Did we're I not. lose you? Oh, you lost us, but we can hear you now. Oh, okay. I apologize. Okay, um, move to the um, community update slide. We're there. Okay. Um, with our community update, which um, everybody should have seen, um, between the months of March um, and September, we send that out every week, and every single week we had at least a WaterWise Wednesday tip and also other content. Um, so over that amount of time uh, in that community update, there were over um, 548,000 opens with WaterWise content in them. Uh, next slide, social media. We're so uh, with social media, we really worked hard to coordinate our city channel along with our uh, WaterWise uh, Facebook and other social media channels. Um, so by doing that, we were able to make uh, two, over 2 million impressions um, throughout the, the, the time period and um, engagement interaction with likes, comments, and shares of over 36,000. Next slide. Okay, then we have um, this, our City 5 table, as we all know since we're on it right now. Um, we worked hard to get additional um, content to them that they could use on the carousel um, uh, and also obviously all the public meetings that we do around water conservation. Um, I thought we would share one of the, the Spokane Parks um, uh, videos that, that has been airing as it's a good example of um, what we do with them. So if you want to go ahead and play yep. one of those, Kristen, that would be great. Okay, great. I think one thing we are can, need to work on a little bit better and is letting the community know what projects we're doing internally. Even though it looks like the city is not being efficient with their water, we are working towards that goal. Um, enjoy this little video with Nick Hammond as the star. We have uh, over 4,000 acres of land that we maintain. Two-thirds of that are irrigated lands. A lot of these systems were put in in the early 1900s through the 1950s, and they're old. So while we have done some great projects that are automated and state-of-the-art, we still have a lot of old stuff. And these are pretty practical problems. So we have 
people running around, plugging in sprinklers, manually watering during the day when the park users are there. And you also see sometimes where we have equipment that is damaged and we need to get there and repair it. So while we do a park or two a year, in terms of new irrigation, we still have old things and we still are sort of limping those along, so to speak, over the next few years until we get them all renovated. Very nice. Very nice, Nick. Good job. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. So with our online engagement this year, we launched the program with a blog um, about the drought ordinance and also created a, um, an informational page about the watering rules. So you can see um, the kind of traction and um, awareness that was created with that. Um, next slide. So all of this added up together for our waterwisespokane.org. We saw a 31% increase in page views over last year um, and a 55% increase in unique users. So more people are seeing this information um, and are spending time learning more about it. The top content that we saw are on those, uh, are on those two pages. Um, definitely the Spokane State, so as Kristen was talking about with the, you know, designer at your door and what plants to plant, um, that by far surpassed other content on the, the, in terms of the information. And then people were interested in rebates and outdoor conservation information as well. Okay, next slide. So this year we also really wanted to leverage local media and decided to invest in a partnership. So we did put an RFP out to all three of the news stations. Um, we wanted a weather tie-in because that is the common denominator of no matter what demographic you are, you're interested in what the weather is going to be and obviously weather is a big part of water conservation. Um, we wanted to be a partner with, a lo with local news programming um, the goal of this investment was to reach more people more often, uh, which we were able to do. And then also uh, our demographic was adults 35 plus. Um, and we wanted some in program placement, which we were able to achieve. So Cats the Y was our, our partner. If you want to go ahead and advance to the next slide. We got you. So uh, we partnered. We partnered with KXOI and Chris Crocker, their chief meteorologist, was our, our um, front person for these WaterWise Wednesday tips. We aired um, one every Wednesday between uh, May through September. Um, so we had the Wednesday tips and then also the five second messages reminding people to water every other day and avoid 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and then in addition, we had a paid schedule around um, the 30 second animated video that talks about why it's important to water every other day. So um, I really wanna point out the, um, our reach of 95%, um, that's reaching our area, um, adults 35 plus, so pretty much everyone. And the big key is that we're reaching them nearly five times. Um, that really, uh, that repetitiveness is really what's going to help um, change behavior and increase awareness. So, overall, in the entire um, the entire part entire partnership, we had 8.7 million impressions. Next slide. Now, I don't know if you can click on these and. These are samples of each one of them, so you might try the bottom right one and see if that users. works. If not, we'll just have to show them another time. Okay, this, we're going to just show a couple real quick videos if you weren't watching KXLY over the summer. This is what you miss. I'm 4 News Now Chief Meteorologist Chris Crocker. Every little bit helps when it comes to protecting our river and aquifer. Learn how you can be water wise. With hot summer days approaching, you may want to think about changing out those spray heads you have in your yard to rotary heads. Those are a thick spray that don't blow away in the wind and have a slower application rate that allow it to soak into your lawn. And we have rebates for those too at waterwisespokane.org. Beat the heat, always water before 10 a.m. or after 6 p.m. Okay, Kirsten. Okay. 
Uh, next slide. And it looks like we have a couple minutes left, so if we can. Yep, I'm, we're, we're on one slide away. Perfect, thank you. Yep, so, um, and it's always important to also uh, kind of quantify our earned media, which is, you know, when, when the news programs do stories on what we're talking about. So um, during that time frame, we had 11 stories done um, by four different news outlets um, with the estimated value of being about $19,000. So I um, always want to make sure that we remember that, you know, when we're talking about this stuff, they hear it and then they want to cover it as well. And that's important. So um, next slide. So uh, looking ahead, uh, really, we want to maintain the great programming that, that Kristen has put together. Um, the WaterWise uh, branding and messaging is um, really taking hold. We want to we want to improve. Can you hear me? Okay, you cut out at okay, improving. Sorry. I think you want to okay. say improving internal collaboration. Yep, and that's it. Okay. Yes. Anybody have questions? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, uh, just a couple. Um, one is what did we? What was our paid media? Like, how much did we put in for paid media? The Eight point seven million. Uh, $20,000. Uh, oh. So we got 20000 of paid and then 19000 in earned? That's a Kirsten question. Correct. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's great. And then you said that we don't have um, an answer as to whether or not it's working. And I guess my question is, are we, are we trying to measure 10 years is an awfully long time to kind of put off knowing if it's working or not? And so... Uh, and in fact, if you guys want to just send me the data, I will do my own analysis if that's what I have to do to get those numbers. But it seems like we could do an easy, you know, day-to-day -day comparison year over year. We could compare weather variables. There's ways that we can know if this is working or not working, even if we can't see a trend. And so I'm just wondering, have we started that process? Yeah, we certainly are looking at the data we have available. Um, and the programs that I have running, we look at those on a case by case. So one by one, we can see those, those results are measurable now. Marlene. So don't forget, this is just the education and outreach presentation. So we come back with a master plan update uh, in March of, is it March? Anyway, so, and we'll have the numbers yet. We don't have even, it's not even year end. So, yeah. so we do bring you numbers every year. Um, I think what Kristen's point was is that it's, it's hard to, to really see the, the long-term impact until you start to get a few years out. But we absolutely are comparing year to year numbers. This is just not the presentation where we do that. Okay, no, thank you. Any other questions? I just wanna say, um, Keep up the good work with neighborhood councils. I know our neighborhood councils in Northwest Spokane, they love the presentations that, that come in from your department. And also, if are we ever gonna get the water truck back? <laughs> it's my big, is it gone for Let me ask my boss. No Lauren? Water truck. I love the water truck. Oh, you don't like our waterways van? Our little mystery I, machine? I liked I know. working in the truck, that was really, a fun thing to do. It was fun. And I think every council member should have to do it at least once. <laughs> we appreciate your enthusiasm on the water trailer. Um, we do have the van, that, which goes out to uh, public events as well. All right, I'll have to try um, that one just to see. <laughs> unfortunately, our guys work out of it during the week as well, so it, it's a little bit of uh, clean over and change over for events. Um, we're, we are here still to do events. Oh. Um, it, it is the uh, point of, of the group is to get yeah. the information out there and make touches with the customer. And you do such a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank um, you. One last thing. We have a, the second in our Public Works series book coming out next month called How Water Works. Just want to plug that real quick. We'll be doing a, a grand book tour throughout Spokane. Perfect. And I'll have copies for you as soon as... They ship. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Marlene and Catherine, you want to come back up? Talk Sorry, to I have a question real quick on oh, the book. Go ahead, Jonathan. On the book. So my son loves to read. He's three years old. And a lot of the city books are very wordy. Is there 
for a lot of work in this book, or is it something that a kid will actually, you know, it'll hold attention? I tested it on my five-year-old. I know that's not three, but it worked on him. Um, I think it's engaging personally, and the pictures are beautiful. Uh, so we'll see. We'll make sure Councilmember Bingo gets a copy. Several copies. Okay. Get, get one for all the kids. All right. Thank you. Okay, GFC update. So good afternoon. Uh, this is going to be the start of a conversation. We're going to continue into your study session on the 2nd, I believe, of November. So wanted to give you enough update of what the conversation has been in the last uh, uh, round since uh, Marlene gave you some in-depth in the past. But just as a quick comment, we've been talking obviously to a lot of people prior to Council's approval of the ordinance back in March as well as afterwards and specifically council asked for an in-depth uh, uh, dive we did put together the mayor's GFC review committee and that's the committee that we uh, went into in depth on any topic they wanted to bring up so the list up here on these two slides are all the topics that the committee wanted to uh, deep dive into which we did do and these discussions came up with effectively five topics they had discussions around interest, which is a more of a policy conversation. Uh, they had uh, discussions around zones. Uh, the existing ordinance has two zones, and there was a lot of discussion about going to a single zone. Uh, there was also some discussion about the measurement stick, and the measurement stick is what we call MCE versus ERU. We'll get into that in a minute. There was also further discussion about requests for phase-in in terms of how to bring this in a little bit over time. And, and incentives. And one thing that came out that wasn't on their original list was a conversation about having another tool and toolbox basically making available a smaller size meter, a 5 8 inch meter. So again, I'll get into some detail there as well. Interest is allowed by state law to acknowledge what we're calling the opportunity costs. The city, when we put in infrastructure, made that choice to invest in that water facility as well as wastewater facility. And the state is acknowledging that opportunity cost in a way for us to recoup through accounting interest. And this is a quick example of what we mean by that. Most of our, for example, water system is pretty old. So the shale tank is the, uh, the, the, the example we keep bringing up that was built in 1965. The year we built it, it cost us $267,000. Today, it would, of course, be in the millions to build that similar tank. And so again, to acknowledge that cost, we were able to look at 1965 interest rate at that time was 3.26%. The policy, or excuse me, the RC allows us to look at 10 years since 1965 to go out 10 years and that equated to that $87,000 and change that we then added to the cost of the project. And keep in mind, always impact, or excuse me, uh, GFCs can only pay for new capacity. And so that last equation there at 45% is what capacity is left for growth. So we only could take 45% of that total number and use that in our actual calculations to understand what a GFC proportionality for that particular item would, would equate into. So obviously we went project, excuse, well project by project, but facility by facility that exists today and went through that same exact process and came up with the cost of, of interest included in the, uh, in the equations. So again, RCW says you can account for that. It is a cost of your opportunity that we chose to do the, that, uh, that work back then or your carrying costs, if you will, to uh, uh, equate into the system. So at the end of the day, oops, um, uh, that's what we mean when we talk about interest. Another topic that's been talked about quite a bit is the zones, and I just really want to remind everybody what the two zones looks like. There was a, um, uh, um, a differential that we saw going through. The, everything in the white area effectively uh, doesn't benefit for, from any facilities that are built in the hashed areas. However, there are some facilities that everybody in the entire city and the service area benefits from, for example, a well. 
everybody needs that well. So any improvements, any new capacity put into that well, the entire system would help pay for that. But once you go through a, um, any kind of pump uh, booster station or inline station booster that pumps that water further, harder through the system, once you go through that system, you get into the hashed areas. And that gets us further actual elevation into the system and you actually have several elevations in that hashed area that we're not showing. But it's a simplistic line in the sand uh, between just taking water out of the wells and serving an area that basically gets served by that white area and then everything else has to go through some kind of a me mechanism to get up to the next area. Booster, more pipes, more tanks to deliver further up into the system. And so that's how that two zone uh, uh, was created. And again, that's what's in your existing ordinance today. So let's start from the beginning, interest. These are the two zones in terms of the first column is your low zone, and then right next to it in orange is what low zone would look like without interest. And you can see it's a very small differential Again, because most of our water system was built very long ago, and a long time ago our interest wasn't that much, and 10, 10 years worth of interest didn't make a huge dent, if you will, in the conversation. The upper zone uh, for water is also listed here, and again, that differential isn't a, a big jump because of that old facilities and those old interest rates, if you will. If uh, you look at that same conversation from a citywide charge, this is what it would look like. So we've left the interest conversation, now we're looking at just a citywide, taking that low zone and upper zone and looking at dispersing it over the entire city. And then I'm just gonna add on, it's the same one, but I'm just gonna add on what it would look like if you took the interest out of the equation. So those are the uh, effect of the conversations we were having around interest and citywide conversations, all kind of in one page for wastewater. And again, wastewater had the two zones. Water. Excuse me, water had the two zones, but I was getting to wastewater, which only had one zone to begin with, because our largest cost and our largest facility is our sewer plant. Everything flows to that sewer plant and all your costs are really involved in that plant alone. And so wanting to show you again, what the no interest would look like from that uh, wastewater perspective. Any questions on the citywide versus interest over those things? Okay, the only thing I wanna point out real quick here in our conversations, it also gave us time to go back and circle back to our sewer plant that obviously had a generational investment. That NLT program that we did was multi, multi millions of dollars worth of work. We also had started with our ass assessment about GFCs with our consultant uh, we signed our contract in 2019. You, of course, you know, uh, had the uh, uh, moratorium come in. That was really at the end of 22. So we had actually been working in the background with our consultant for several years, and we were, had gathered a lot of our data in the initial work with our consultant. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the opportunity to, to have to talk uh, after con council made their decision and asked us to go back and talk to people gave us the opportunity to go back to all of our uh, um, uh, resources and pull up the most current information. And that was really the closeout work that our uh, NLT program was going through. And so what's in uh, light blue is uh, the adjusted numbers based on all of the final work coming out of NLT. And that actually gave an adjustment that we want to make sure we do capture it as an amendment uh, to the process. So moving to the ERU versus MCE conversation, this is just a way to measure when we talk about getting to the unit measurement in, in how we're going to charge people. ERU is your equivalent residential unit. It basically comes down to what a standard size house would use for water. And then if you were gonna use that as your measurement, you would then measure everything off of that standard use of a house. And so if your standard is 1,100 gallons per day, uh, and anybody that would come in with a bigger house, for example, and had more use, you would then go back and do all your calculations on that original unit or that original standard. That's a house basically size standard and use that you would then compare to. It gets a little tricky when you get to commercial because then you're trying to translate 
how many standard houses that commercial building is using, if that makes sense. So the original, uh, excuse me, the, the ordinance that council passed, we actually used MCE, which is your meter uh, capacity equivalency. That's based on a physical meter and how much physical water can be produced by that particular size of meter. Okay. Jonathan, council member Bingle, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you. I've got a, I've got a couple, but I can wait to the end. The end. I apologize. Okay. So uh, again, the group had a lot of conversations about the, the use of one one over the other, and quite frankly, they both have pros and cons. Uh, again, we felt the uh, tying it to the meter was going to give us a more direct connection to conservation, because uh, again, that physical meter, when it's purchased, those costs are based on the size of meter, and people can make the choice, do I want to afford a larger meter, or can I live within the meter uh, that, uh, that can service everything I need for, for that household. You don't have a ne necessarily a, a nexus or a direct connection to a meter when you go with ERU, because you're really, again, establishing a standard size home and what that standard size home would use. Uh, um, for, for water, but it doesn't connect it to the actual meter, if that makes sense. So when we did look at the basis of ERU and MCE, uh, you can see that there was only just, just barely over 1% difference between the two methodologies. Uh, there is a bigger difference with the sewer, and it basically comes down to, which is another reason we chose not to go with MCE, is we actually need to do more study, more work around the sewer side of things. It gets down into the technical look of how much groundwater is getting pushed into our sewer pipes. Our sewer pipes are very deep in the ground. They're actually physically in the groundwater and you have a lot of physical uh, um, um, uh, forces of water being pushed into our sewer pipe. That sewer is filled with groundwater which takes away capacity. And again, getting back to the basis of a, of a GFC, we only can talk about new capacity that we can charge to uh, a development. It's all based on new capacity, and if that capacity is being taken up by groundwater, we don't know how much capacity is actually left in the sewer line. And so uh, it's something if council wants to go to, we can do it, but we would need a couple year process of, of study to really understand system-wide what kind of actual groundwater effect is going on in our pipes and understanding how much capacity is not there. I just could could you explain what would be the overall value of that study um, to, to, to having that information? The old, only, only value is if there is a desire to go to ERU, we would have to understand that capacity issue before we could come up with a better number. Right now we're at 7% difference. I don't know if that's a true statement until after that study. We could be at 1%, we could be somewhere else. Okay. So until we do that study, we wouldn't get there on the sewer side. I'm feeling very confident that uh, the two methods are within a percent of each other. So there's no other additional practical benefit to, to that study just in, a, in setting this rate? It would, exactly, it would, give us, it would give us that ERU rate. Again, that's not what the current uh, ordinance has. It has the MCE rate. I'm just saying if there is a desire to go that way, we have more work to do on the sewer side. This is what the single zone would look like, again, by, you know, based on those comparisons. And again, you're not going to see that 1% versus 7% change until we would have more, more data on that ER or, uh, water side or sewer side, excuse me. Uh, again, what came out of the uh, uh, conversations was the uh, potential option to have a 5 8 meter. Uh, historically speaking, we, we had uh, 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 allowed 5 8 meters in the system. A good lion's share of the historic meters that are out there are, in fact, 5 8 And so they work fine for small houses with small lots. Uh, so we wanted to bring that back as that option, and you can see across the board it is a, a lower cost, whether we, we continue with the two zones or go to a, uh, a citywide or wherever uh, that conversation ends up. We do want to put some kind of um, brackets around it. We want to want to make sure it has uh, Spokanescape, and again, make sure that you are living well within what that meter can deliver, but it's definitely possible. Uh, before I leave the topic, another reason we wanted to also uh, talk about that difference between um, um, 
MCE versus ERU. When you talk about ADUs, when you want to add something on, if you were to go with the um, ERU process, again, that's a standard house. It's basically uh, uh, that footprint of that standard house. Well, when you add something to that, uh, it's, it's more footprint, which means uh, you would likely get into needing to pay a GFC under the ERU scenario versus the MCE, if your meter, let's just say a quarter, a three quarter inch meter that you have in your house today, if you have capacity left in that three quarter inch meter for your ADU, you don't need to pay another GFC because you don't need to change up your, your meter. So again, another uh, benefit, if you will, from, from a, the perspective of the two. But again, it's a, it's a measurement. You can go either way. We just need more work on the ERU side. Uh, the other items that were discussed, like I mentioned, was phase-in uh, as well as incentives. And I'd li like to uh, invite up uh, Spencer Gardner to talk about the incentives real quick. It looks like we have about six minutes. Okay. Um, so on the incentive side, there's a couple of key points that I think are important to understand. The first, uh, there was a recent change in state law that requires us to essentially backfill GFCs that are waived. So our historic practice was to waive GFCs. We just didn't charge them for certain types of developments in certain locations. Um, it's a little, we're more limited in our ability to do that now. And that is, again, because state law has changed such that even, for example, for affordable housing projects, um, if those fees are reduced or waived in some way, we need to come up with funding from somewhere else to fill in that gap, we can't just ignore that, that those developments actually incur a cost to the system. So when we're talking about incentives, what we're really talking about is what kinds of projects do we want to provide incentives for and how do we want to provide funding to incentivize those projects. Um, there's, uh, I, I like to talk a little bit about natural development incentives. Within the constraints of the state law, um, some of aspects of our proposal could provide sort of a natural incentive in the form of charging a different fee. So when you think about, for example, in the, in the water service or the water GFC, uh, the two zone structure does provide an incentive in the sense that somebody developing in the lower zone is paying a lower GFC. Now that's tied to a technical rationale because they're using less of the infrastructure to provide water to that location. But there is, um, that does create sort of an incentive for development in those areas. Um, another example, we have we've removed fire service um, from the calculation of your GFCs. So you're not being punished for providing fire service. Um, you don't have to pay for the capacity that's needed to serve the fire service. So that's just something to keep in mind. In terms of what, what's actually um, the, the proposal that we're formulating, um, our focus is on affordable and workforce housing projects. The current ordinance already uh, exempts affordable housing from having to pay the GFC rate. Um, we will, if, if that is to be retained, we will need to find a funding source to offset the, um, the reduced income or revenue to the, uh, the GFC program for that. And um, that brings me to another point, which is, I think when we're talking about the incentive program, it's important to separate the incentives from the question of where that funding comes from. So right now, this slide is really focused on what kind of incentives would we want to provide. Um, our target would be to expand beyond just the lowest income projects that would qualify, for example, for state or federal affordable housing programs so that we can also expand it to um, programs that serve workforce housing. And our MFTE program is sort of a good template there. We go up to 115% of the AMI um, of the area income. And so we would uh, propose to keep that um, and allow for our incentives to apply to those kinds of housing projects as well. But they would be tied to certain affordability requirements. So as an example, if a project qualifies for our MFTE 12 or 20 year program, which requires a certain portion of the housing to be set aside for the workforce or affordable housing levels, then um, that project could qualify. The, our parking to people proposal, which is the, or program, which is the, um, the sales tax exemption program would also qualify a project or any project that qualifies and uses state or federal affordable housing funding. All three of those types of projects 
would qualify, and the um, incentive that we have um, s sort of proposed up to this point is that anything built, it, and this presumes that there is a two-zone structure, that's what's in the current ordinance, so if council ultimately went for a single-zone structure, we might have to rethink this approach. But under the two-zone structure, um, a development in the upper zone would pay the lower zone fee. So our, our backfill would have to cover the differential between that upper zone fee and the lower zone fee. If a development is in the lower zone, um, we would charge 50% of the lower zone fee. So the amount that we have to backfill would be the difference between the lower zone fee and 50% of the lower zone fee. And then we would also um, cap the incentive at $40,000 for water and $20,000 for sewer. That's, that's effectively the two inch rate. So for projects that need a two inch connection or less, you would, you would have the total amount of the incentive available to you. For a project that needs something more than a two inch meter, um, you, would, you would sort of get the incentive up to that two inch level and then the rest of it would need to be paid um, just through the project funding. So um, that's kind of the, uh, a rundown of the proposal. Um, I guess I don't have a discussion about the funding sources. Um, right now, I think there's a lot of options on, this, on the table. There has been some discussion about 1590. There's been some discussion about um, the increase in utility taxes that we expect to come in from the higher GFC revenues. Um, there may be other options on the table. And I, I guess I would say at this point, we're still kind of working out where that funding might come from, and that's all wrapped up in budget discussions as well. Sorry. Is that my alarm to finish? <laughs> <laughs> Hurry up. <laughs> oh, it scared me. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I guess I just wanna ask, I mean, is there consideration, because I'm just a little concerned that we might be going down the path of mandatory inclusionary zoning or linkage fees or that sort of thing, and is that anything that's being discussed? Because we still have a housing crisis, and all of that would only, I think, make it worse, far worse, in fact if we go down that path. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by linkage fees. Can you? That's what that? Seattle introduced. So anytime you build a market rate building, you have to pay fees to subsidize non-market rate. Okay. Um, I've not had any discussions about that. So, okay. uh, so inclusionary zoning is a, essentially a requirement that you have to provide affordable housing. Yeah. And then the linkage fees is sort of a similar idea, I think. Um, as far as I know, there are no discussions going on, at least not in my department. Um, specifically about that. I can't promise that it would never sure. come up in the future, but up to this point, it hasn't really been discussed. Okay. I just wanna make sure that however we're gonna solve the, the, the pay for, it's not gonna be something that just makes our housing situation worse, so. Yeah. Go ahead. Could you send us those slides? Yeah. yeah. I mean, specifically the ones you covered. Oh, the incentive slides? Yes, please. Yeah, I think the whole slide deck can be made available, so. So are you done? With your presentation? I'm, that's my incentive part. So. Okay. So if it's, you want to wrap it up, and I yep. believe Councilmember Bingle has questions too. Sure, not a problem. So just want to, besides the 5 eighths and the uh, updating of the sewer charges, we just wanted to also bring up two items that we're going to be clarifying as part of any amendment, which is uh, master meters. Uh, we just want to make sure that they're clarified that, you know, master meters usually are for PUDs where they come in and buy, they might buy the meter, but then over time they would pay the actual GFC as houses came in. We just want to make sure there's a slight or a, a connection to this new process of GFCs. And the other one is just clarifying uh, our ENR index to make sure we're going to keep up with costs over time. Uh, we want to make sure that's clarified that it's uh, October to October each year we're going to go in and assess what the ENR was and then apply it for the next January. Uh, in general for process, so more on that later. So we were just talking with uh, Plan Commission, we're gonna be going through the hearing on Wednesday and talking about really there's a few options uh, to move forward with. Obviously you do have an ordinance in place, one option could be leave it in place, plus that 5 eighths uh, option uh, we would recommend putting in, uh, updating the sewer costs that we mentioned, and then the clarifications I just talked about is obviously one option. Another option obviously is to look at all of the topics and go through and have those uh, um, edited or, or adjusted in some way. And uh, just throwing up a staff recommendation uh, would be to obviously put in that 5 eighths meter uh, get the sewer charge updated. Uh, we are actually uh, recommending two, a phase in, basically what is uh, in place now for GFCs to what the full freight would be, looking to do that over a two year step after that. So uh, we'll come forward later with some more details on that. And then again, the clarifications. So that's what we have uh, for now. Council Member Bingo, would you like to ask the last question? 
has two. I, I have like 15 questions. This is unfortunate. We ran out of time. Um, but I guess, um, Ian and Catherine, we can just do a conference call or something and get um, for it. So I, I don't even know that there's one in particular that I want to ask because there's so many big questions in this. So um, I guess we can just, uh, the three of us, meet on the same uh, Yep, exactly. We're happy to answer anything offline as well as obviously the study session will have, I believe, 30 minutes is what uh, council set aside. So we'll have another opportunity for questions and you can also contact them directly. Anybody else? Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. Andrew Chance. Uh, library levy lid lift. I think we can do it in 10... 15 minutes? I sure hope so. Okay. I'm just going to bring up our slides here. All right. Thank you so much for having us here again. Uh, you recall we were here back in July to express our need for a, a library levy renewal. And we're here with a bit more urgency. Uh, we hope to get something uh, in front of the council to get on the ballot uh, for this February. Um, with me, I have Nicole Edwards, who is our finance director at the library. Current status, as you know, uh, successful completion of construction of our three new buildings and four renovations uh, from the 2018 bond. We're still settling in to our new buildings, new functionality, uh, new services, new staff, often new customers, and, and new expectations, really. And we're still adjusting to a world that's coming out of a pandemic, uh, so really adjusting uh, customer expectations uh, as folks are coming through our door and, and what services are, are, are needed moving forward. 2023 so far, we have been an active uh, uh, organization. We offer over 200 library-led educational events per month. That does not include uh, events that are led by the community. So these are just library-led uh, events. Uh, over 43,000 citizens have attended these programs. Some of these are also one-on-ones, so if it's more technical help with, say, our business research or our technology services, that could be one-on-one -on -one help or in our Inland Northwest room as well. We've had more than 18,000 free meeting, study, and event space reservations so far this year for a total of 57,000 hours of usage. So when you're talking about an ROI and investment in our facilities, it's huge. Uh, very well utilized. And we make it easy for folks to utilize as well because folks can just sign up online and use a meeting room or event space, and that seems to be working really, really well. Uh, we're also continuing to build our partnership with Spokane Public Schools for enhanced library services. So we just finished up the last of the middle schools. Uh, so all middle schoolers can now request items be sent uh, from the public library uh, right to their school, as well as uh, we can request, the, to the general citizens can also request items from the middle schools uh, be sent to the library branches. So really expanding the access and footprint of what the public library can offer in a very minimal investment on our part. Um, so we're really happy with that partnership. Uh, with Spokane Public Schools. They've been uh, amazing partners. Uh, we're also continuing to see our visits climb. We're well on our way of surpassing a million visits this year. Uh, that was always an aspiration for us, and uh, if I, my projections are right, I think that we'll hit about a million two hundred thousand. So a real huge increase in the utilization of the libraries. So with that context, I want to hand it over to Nicole, who's going to go over our financial picture. Thank you for having us again, appreciate it. So here on the slide, you're gonna just see our financial snapshots. This is the 2024 budget as it stands. Um, as you can see, of course, the financial resources, the levy lid lift does continue to be a substantial portion of, of uh, dollars that we receive. And then you'll notice in our expenditures, our people, so salaries and benefits, that, that combined make up, it makes up 69% of our overall spend, uh, spending. So really our, our most valuable uh, commodity is is our staff members um, of course you know being a library books it's dwindled down a little bit we have a lot of online resources everything like that but it's really our our, our, our pro programming and, and staff that make the biggest difference we also do have an ever-evolving method of collecting and analyzing data of our programs 
and the services that, that we offer to the public just to ensure that the return on the uh, in, in invested tax dollar is, is effective. Thank you. So here, um, again, is the fi financial uh, projections. This is the similar to the slide that, that we presented pr uh, previously, only it's been updated with the 2024 budget differences, um, one of the main ones being that the that there, there is no in, uh, increase in our, in our general fund dollars for 2024. So on, on average, our growth of operations has been 9% since 2013. And after factoring in the 2024 uh, general fund, that increase has been less than 2% since 2013. Uh, this, these, uh, these projections also assume the renewal of, of the levy lift in the years 2025 to 2027. It, it assumes that that, that will go through. Um, historically, we've achieved voter approval of 66% in 2013 and 71% in 2017. Uh, so bot bottom line, even with the continuation um, of the levy lid lift, we are, we are pro uh, projecting to uh, very significantly spend down our, our fund balance, which we were fortunate enough to uh, con conserve uh, some of that in, in recent years during the pandemic and during construction. So. Any questions on the numbers at this point? Any questions? Councilmember Bingo, any questions? That's a no. So just a real simple breakdown of uh, should this renewal go out to the public, uh, what happens if it were to pass? This is, a, this is a renewal. It's a continuation of what has already been established in 2013. So all the good things that you've seen happen with the library over the past 10 years, that continues. It's expanded access for reading, learning, and technology services. It's access to our events and the uh, real substantial use of meeting and community gathering spaces as well as our media studios. Uh, youth education continues. Uh, support of our small business uh, resources continues at the current level. Uh, and we continue our partnership with Spokane Public Schools. Should it fail, that doesn't happen. You're gonna see reduced services. Uh, you'll see reduced operations and hours, reduced days and hours likely, uh, because that's nearly 20% of our funding, this, le this levy renewal. It's absolutely essential for us to, to get this funding in, in place for next year. That's a, a brief synopsis of what, how that would appear on a ballot. Uh, it's very similar to previous years as well. Again, it's a renewal. And this is officially, our, our board did make a recommendation back uh, in uh, July to council to place a levy on the tw uh, February 2024 ballot. We're asking for three years. Uh, this uh, would align us with, <clears throat> excuse me, Spokane Public Schools levy schedule, which really reinforces the partnership that we have with them. Uh, it also allows for that strategic and uh, fiscally responsible spend down of our reserves. Uh, we know that we're in a tough economic time right now as a community, so, so really using those reserves responsibility, or responsibly uh, is very important to us. It also allows us to refine those operational needs. So as I had said, we're coming out uh, of not just a post-pandemic, but also new services. So it really allows us to dial things in over the next couple years. So should the ask need to be different in future years, we'll be really well informed at what that ask needs to be. That's it from us. Any questions? Yes. Okay, let's see. We'll go ahead and then Lori, you wanna go first? Oh, Andrew, thank you for that. Um, have you hired a consultant Four. to um, help you through the election process? You know, we've worked in past years with this uh, nonprofit uh, called Every Library. They help libraries throughout mm -hmm. the nation uh, with uh, measures that are on the ballot. And we've, we've learned a lot from them. Uh, so as far as uh, working with a consultant, we don't feel that we need to in order to uh, build out our information only campaign. I would ask that you consider hiring a consultant. Um, some of the folks I've talked with who do this for a living are saying February is not a good time to appear on the ballot. Um, our constituents are saying they are tax weary and don't want more property tax. Um, and you have schools, you're competing with schools, you're competing with parks, you may be competing with a public safety levy as well on fe in February. So. I would really ask both um, you and Parks to 
consider a consultant so that they would give you the very best advice on what would be the best time to actually go to the, to the voters for this ask. It's, it's not going to get easier as people are really tightening their, their spending and sure. very concerned about the way, the direction that our property tax is going. And I, just a reminder, this is a renewal and we don't actually look at the school as competition. We look at them as a partner uh, in, in building out right. future services. The, but we're talking about the voters. We're sure. not talking about how, how we look at it. So it's important to look at what voters are seeing as well. Sure, I appreciate that. Go ahead. Yeah, and I guess I would just ask, um, you know, what in your mind is, what portion of this goes to sort of neighborhood libraries and what portion is downtown? Because obviously with the parks uh, effort, you know, that's like 99% focused on our neighborhoods. And I think there's a lot of synergy over focusing on our neighborhoods, investing in our neighborhoods and that sort of thing. And I have heard, as, as I'm sure you have, you know, a lot of frustrations and concerns over the downtown space. And so just contemplating that in terms of a successful outing on this, I mean, is that something that you're, you're thinking about in terms It'd of- It'd be system-wide that the, the mm -hmm. funding goes to it's, it's, it's it, it wouldn't be a, a central focus. Obviously, central does cost more to operate. It's a, a bigger size, but this would be system-wide spending uh, just as it has been in the past. The original funding, actually, uh, when you're talking about it, the, the original levy, it was focused at Indian Trail, Hilliard, and East Side Libraries because those hours were so substandard at 22 hours per week. We've really been able to, to, to widen the access throughout the community. Okay. And that's first and foremost, always, always, always uh, on our minds. Well, and so I guess my follow-up would just be if, if this were to fail, how would resources be reprioritized going forward? We would need to talk with the community about uh, uh, future directions just as we had when we were in dire straits back in 2012. So we would be looking at usage. We would be looking at all all that stuff to really help uh, help us prioritize. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Did you? Let's see. Brian and then Betsy. Go ahead. Okay. So when you think about why now, are there any other reasons that you want to share with us as to why does this need to happen now? Right. Well, if it doesn't, you know, our, our funding ends at the end of 2024 uh, with this levy. So we need to we need enough time to get out to educate the public. Uh, for a February ballot measure. Schools are going out in February regardless. Mm -hmm. They go out countywide. Every school district is going, that needs to is going to be going out. Uh, and we feel like our partnership is strong enough uh, with Spokane Public Schools that it makes sense for us to go out at the same time. Uh, going out in February as well, should it be a yes or no? That gives us a lot of time, well, enough time, probably actually not even enough time <laughs> to really have those conversations and, and, and communicate with staff and communicate with the public of what those impacts are actually going to be. Because 20% of our funding, it's not going to be good if it doesn't pass. Um, so we really feel the responsibility to have the, the right conversations with both internally and externally. Okay. I, I certainly understand the cost and people are tax weary, but the libraries have delivered, and they have played a, in my opinion, have played a critical role in our city in so many areas, uh, in partnership with us, cooling and warming centers, event spaces, we meet at the library, it's all free, opportunities that never existed before where people can go. The Hive is just like state of the art. Who hasn't been to the Hive for a meeting that didn't cost you anything? That's critical, and our libraries, anchor neighborhoods just like parks do. Mm -hmm. I mean, East, the East Central Library is now the hub of East Central. So I think it'll be up to the voters, but I certainly would not like to see a cut because that would be really detrimental to our city as we grow. Thank you. Okay, so we're running short on time. I can, can make a 10 seconds. Two like, seconds. Yeah. About 7.5 seconds. Yeah, I think that this is, uh, I think partnership with the schools is something that you can play on the messaging. I think it's been a demonstrated success, and I think that timing makes a lot of sense. That was yeah. five. Okay, <laughs> good job. Okay, anybody that has additional questions, I'm sure Andrew would welcome a phone call. Yep, always. Or visit, so please feel free to do that. Thank you. Thank you all. And last, Nick, you want to come up and talk about parks? Or a park ballot, I should say. Last, but hopefully not least, right? Yeah. We will see. All right, so my name is Nick Ammon. I'm in our park planning group. Thank you for having me. Um, I will try and be as abbreviated as possible if I can figure out how to make this mouse work. 
okay, we've had a chance to connect with you, so I'm gonna be high level about why we're here, which is Riverfront Park has now been completed. I think it's open, the community loves Riverfront Park, and everybody points at their playground in their neighborhood and says, when are you gonna do something about my old rotted wood playground? We just removed one in, in Minnehaha within the last two weeks. And so that was our question back in February of 2021 for our community, which is what should we do next? And we heard that we want you to preserve what you have, enhance our play opportunity, and expand park service where it's not. Those were divided down into several different categories in land, water, people, and legacy. And uh, I wanna say this was driven by the community. That's the important thing for us is that we heard from over 5,000 members of our community. The most popular uh, park planning work that we'd done prior had only had about 1,500 touches with the community. So we were really proud to say this is a community-driven set of priorities. Um, in terms of what should happen in parks. And what we heard was play, restrooms, I don't know if you've ever heard about restrooms being an issue before, um, trailheads and trails, particularly soft surface trails, enhance general maintenance in your parks, graffiti removal more quickly, restroom repair more quickly, etc. Safety. Those were the sort of the top tier takeaways from that planning process that was about a two year, or a year and a half process, excuse me. The second tier community priorities is that the nice to have the ads would be pickleball, sport courts, BMX facilities, disc golf, other opportunities to engage that aren't organized rec necessarily. And I would say the biggest thing we heard was invest in neighborhoods, invest in neighborhoods, invest in neighborhoods. That's what we heard across the board. And so we also acknowledge the fact that we don't have the funding to do that investment in the way we were asked. That's why it hasn't happened so far. And so we're evaluating ways to do that. And just to put that in a graphic, when you look at all of the bond dollars that the City Parks Department has spent over the last 20 years, only a quarter of it has gone into these neighborhood park facilities. And so the large majority has gone to special use facilities and pools, um, Riverfront Park, and then um, some special operational facilities, et cetera. So all good and valuable investment, but it's time for neighborhoods. As a result, Two-thirds of our facilities aren't getting the kind of input and maintenance that they need. Half of them have zero capital dollars at all in the last 20 years. And so that's a, that's a lot of work, a lot of deferred capital that needs to get taken care of. And all the while, the amount we spend on parks every year goes down just a little bit from the year before. Um, we're down 0.3% over the last 20 years. What that really means is about $2.5 million a year in 2021 dollars. If we were to put that in context of inflation, our budget this year in 2020, well, in 2022, um, is slightly less than 3% increase per year from 2000 to 2022. So we're just losing a little bit to inflation. Um, so that budget's been tracking um, that way for quite a while. Now, since February of 2021, We've been working with a community to adopt a park plan in, in the middle of last year. This council adopted, I believe, in September of last year. Um, then we worked with an executive committee all of this spring. A couple of you were on it. Hey, Jonathan, we'll see you digitally there, and, and Betsy. Um, that team helped us take the master plan and operationalize it into a program of improvements. So we took that park plan, we worked with council, park board, the mayor's office, our subject matter experts to formulate what we call healthy parks, healthy neighborhoods. And that program is in your packet. Um, it's, it's extensive, but um, the, the highlights of which are investing in neighborhoods, and I'll, and I'll hit those here in a second. And it also recommended the preferred funding source. I do wanna highlight that just last month, I guess it's still October, yeah. so just this month, uh, the park board resolved to adopt that program called Healthy Parks, Healthy Neighborhoods. They also uh, recommended a resolution, adopted a resolution to put a, a levy lid lift onto the February ballot in 29, for 29 cents per thousand. And of course they can't put that on, they're making that request uh, from you as council. And they also asked that we developed a potential partnership for bringing that back to them and back to you as an opportunity to uh, conduct outreach there. So background aside, what is this? It, the recommendation is a new levy ballot measure to make uh, significant enhancements in our park system. Liberty Park is one of the playgrounds that was just funded and opened by the, the ARPA money allocated by this council. Um, that was about an $800,000 uh, playground renovation project and it's spectacular. My daughters were actually playing there Friday. Um, this would be an 11, plus or minus, $11 million annual budget increase for parks. That is 30% uh, would go to operational staff and equipment and 70% to capital projects. 
the recommendation from our executive committee was 20 years, and of course, that t February 2024 ballot. There was much discussion on that, and I can come back to that in a second. It falls into several buckets, most of which uh, here on the right is that big green chunk of renovating what you have. We heard invest, investing in our existing parks, improving the conditions, and shrinking the maintenance gap in our existing facilities by fixing things is the highest priority we have. Um, and then the orange piece is enhancing park user experience. That's people. That's two buckets. That's a 50% increase in operational staff to go out and fix things within our park system. And it's the expansion of the park ranger program to go as a safety initiative outside of Riverfront Park and provide that presence in some of our facilities that are uh, needing that presence. So think Brown's Edition, think Mission Park, think those problem parks where we have a lot of people from different backgrounds in the same area. And having that buffer is a thing that makes mom comfortable to go to the playground. So that's what that's designed to do. Uh, there is a small wedge, and if you're in North Indian Trail, Shiloh Hills, or Qualchin Hills out in Lake Tahoe Valley, you'd be interested to see a new park where you have no access. Shiloh Hills being the best example of that, getting west of Nevada is almost impossible north of Francis on foot. And so putting parks in high proximity to a lot of families, several hundred households would be within a 10 minute walk by adding that small expansion. Um, and then the administration, the ability to design these projects, do the outreach we need to do, and administer them. Let's hold on a second. Councilmember Bengal, did you have a question? More of a comment. I, do we have video of Councilwoman Wilkerson enjoying the toys as well? Because it was one of the more impressive things I've seen this year. <laughs> She's pretty good on a zip Facebook. line. No. <laughs> She's pretty good on a zip line, I will say that. Um, so what does this really mean for us? In terms of capital, it means repairing all of the playgrounds in this city that need repair. That's over 35 playgrounds. That's replacing roughly half the restrooms within our park system. That's replacing all of the sport courts, replacing all of the manually irrigated uh, systems throughout our parks so that we can free up that labor to do other things and then be more efficient with our watering. That's improving our trailheads properly. And that's three major park renovations and parks that are really rough shape. Uh, that's Harmon, Minnehaha, and Grant. And then that's adding new parks. So Shiloh Hills in uh, North, excuse me, Shiloh Hills Park, yet to be named, Meadow Glen and North Indian Trail, and then Qualchin Hills in Leita Valley. I'm responding to existing development in all of those cases. This is also the discussion of adding all weather surface fields. We'd like to add four to six all the weather surface fields throughout this city, two on the South Hill, and then four at Dwight Merkel, to increase that ability for teams to go play in inclement weather. Um, you'll see that there's none shown in, in District 1 right now, but there is a big expansion going on at Plants Ferry. And so we're looking to leverage that investment by not duplicating that service in the same location. From a maintenance standpoint, we kind of hit on this 50% increase in maintenance staff. Really, that's responding to get the graffiti off these buildings faster, fix these fixtures more quickly, um, mow the lawn more frequently, empty the garbages more frequently. We heard this from the community as a high priority, so that's staff. Uh, the park rangers, and then administration. This is roughly a third of each, uh, the third of the work happening in each of the three city council districts. We have detailed maps of where these uh, improvements may, may be located. Um, slight emphasis here in, in the areas of highest need, District 1 being one of those. And I always want to take the opportunity to say if you took all the park land in District one and district three and you added it together, it would still be less than district two. So we have to do something to less. improve that. What's that? I said significantly less. Yeah, so we would like to rectify a little bit of that with some additional development up north. Now, what does it cost? This is where the, the rub hit, hits here. Um, we're looking at roughly $10 a month for the median home in the city of Spokane would be a new tax. And that would be uh, roughly eight fifty dollars for the uh, $350,000 home. That's that, again, ten and a half to $11 million revenue in uh, annually for parks. That is an increase of 5% overall city levy on the home. So if you take everything the city does, including EMS levy and some of those other items, you put them together, this is a 5% increase on that. It leaves roughly a quarter of the city levy capacity um, available for other uses. So in, in a summary, you know, what is it doing? It is improving parks where they are aging today. 
It is adding parks where we do not have them. Uh, it's preserving our natural spaces and, and better maintaining what we have. And we hope to provide that uh, safety presence. Of course, we're not police, but do it in the way that we, we can do it on our own. But most of all, it's investing in neighborhoods. And we, would, we heard that message from our, our citizens. So what we hope to accomplish is to be um, asking for a ballot resolution from this group. Um, our executive committee recommended we be on February of 2024. Why February? One, voter choice, um, knowing that Spokane Public Schools would be on that ballot, knowing that um, the tax dollar that's available for all of us, we were sort of all draw, drawing from the same bucket there. So we'd like to be available to provide that voter choice between parks, schools, and libraries, if possible. Two, it allows us to potentially partner with those groups during an outreach and, and education campaign. Um, one of the things we heard from Desitel Hagee in our executive committee process as a consultant was, we would like you to provide that choice and be there at the same time. Don't wait to be shortly after everybody else. Um, we think it's responsive. Three years from the time we started this project back in 2021, we'd like to be on the ballot. Three years is quite a while. Uh, we want to deliver on those promises to the community. Though there are opportunities in August or November to potentially be on the ballot and still secure those funds if that is a, an affirmative vote in that April of 2025 timeframe. It makes our implementation maybe a little bit slower, but that is an opportunity if, if you felt compelled to do that. Um, and, luckily, and the other thing is economic uncertainty. We don't know what the economy is going to do in a year. And we, we have more certainty for February than we do for November. Those are the things we're thinking. That's why we heard from our executive team that that priority of February. Again, willing to adjust. We're still looking for the right partnership. We believe we have a potential partnership with a Spokane uh, with libraries, of course, all, as city. Imagine if we went out together and said, hey, we, we're all talking to you from uh, at the same time. We're sort of together but separate. Um, same with Spokane Public Schools. We've been uh, discussing a potential partnership there. Nothing formal to, uh, to recommend here today other than if we're investing in neighborhoods and investing in community and we're asking for tax dollars, maybe it's responsible for us to coordinate. Maybe it's not. So that's something we'd ask for feedback on. But these are the mission alignment, those collaborative elements we're looking for in a partner. We also evaluated public safety. There's nothing on the ballot for February now. Doesn't mean there couldn't be. Doesn't mean it couldn't be another time with that partner as well. I'm thinking we've done enough talking. You've done very, very well. Does anybody have quick questions? Yes. Thank you. That was excellent. Really um, good. Just to be clear, I, I do support parks and libraries, and I really firmly believe that a good consultant, you, you absolutely need one. And the way I heard you speak was, well, we could do this, or maybe we'll think about partnering with schools and if you get somebody who does this for a living, you're going to get a better outcome than if you try and do it yourself. Because none of us are the experts. None of us would, well, most of us wouldn't run for office without having a consultant or a campaign manager, nor should you. And it's a very short time frame. When you think about, um, you've got some of November, December's a wash because people are in holiday mode. So you've got one month to do your education, January. Mm -hmm. That's it. I don't know if that's enough time. So, Thank you. But just to be on the record, I support libraries. I support parks. Um, just concerned that you're not going to get the best result if you go out in February. Thank you, Lori. Okay, one last question. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. Great presentation. Um, you mentioned that, that we're maybe not going to install uh, uh, all-weather play areas in District 1 because Plants Ferry is building them. I will just say Plants Ferry is a considerable distance from the heart of District 1, and I wouldn't base anything off of what's happening that far away. So I, my encouragement would be when we cite the Shiloh Hills neighborhood park mm. that we include an all-weather play field in that location. Thanks for that, Mike. And I don't want to misrepresent that we're not installing anything in District 1, just not a big four-top complex. But yeah. when we renovate Harmon Park, we are looking at providing that amenity oh, yeah, at Harmon. Yeah. And I think Minnehaha is another uh, opportunity, too. Perfect. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Nick, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks. We'll be back here at 3.30. If you have questions of Nick, give him a call. Um, I'm sure he'll take them. And we're adjourned, everybody, in November. Yeah. Good luck.